The events of this temptation of our Lord take place uh, just on the heels of his baptism in the Jordan River. That baptism not only identified Jesus to the world, but also identified Jesus to Satan and all his evil minions. As far as Satan was concerned, Jesus' baptism painted a great big bullseye on the back of Jesus and made him Satan's number one target, just as Adam had been Satan's number one target after God created man. It is important to understand that these temptations were very real. We shouldn't think that Jesus, being true God, simply sat back and didn't have to endure much. But no, the text tells us that those temptations were very real. Luke reminds us of Jesus' humanity by telling us that after Jesus battled Satan for 40 days, he was hungry. Indeed, shows his humanity. God doesn't get hungry. God is spirit and has no need of food. But as human beings, we most certainly do. The fact that Jesus was hungry reminds us that Jesus withstood Satan's attacks by using his human nature. He used no resources that we as human beings don't have as well. The second temptation in Jesus' gospel today is a special focus for us today. I think it may be the, the harshest, the cruelest of the three. Here again, that temptation. The devil took Jesus up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Satan shows all the kingdoms of the inhabited world to Jesus. These kingdoms that originally belonged to God, and indeed are still under his king kingly rule, but for a time the devil operates as if he's the prince of all things. God created them and crowned Adam and Eve king and queen over these kingdoms of the earth, even though they did not yet exist, but they certainly would uh, reign as God's perfect creatures uh, over God's perfect kingdom. But when Adam and Eve fell to Satan's temptation, they gave Satan control over all these kingdoms. Adam and Eve became slaves to sin under his reign in his kingdom now. Satan's words, it has been delivered to me, remind us of the tragedy of Adam and Eve's surrender to the devil in the Garden of Eden. Satan showed these kingdoms to Jesus in an instant. But I'm sure that Jesus also saw all the devil's cruelty, his sin and pain and suffering that he's inflicted under those kingdoms, under his influence. Must have been like watching someone torture your own family. And then Satan offers the deal. Just like I was trying to make deals with the kids here today. You know, you can end all this pain and suffering. I'd be willing to give everything that I've got in this world back to you, Jesus. Then you could run it the way you wanted it and know that everything would be just right. All I'm asking is that you worship me just one time. Not asking really for all that much. And you get so much in return. Why can't we seal this deal and just get along? This is just riddled with lies. Lie upon lie. To try to get Jesus to give up his divine nature to give up his divine power at the expense of trying to reclaim it. This temptation never dies. The end of our gospel text today says that when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. That means the devil only withdrew in order to regroup and Send out this temptation again and again and again. 
Indeed, all three temptations followed Jesus throughout his, his entire ministry. Every time the people wanted to make him their earthly king, they were doing Satan's will. They were agents of his temptation, tempting Jesus to forgo the agony of the cross and compromise with the devil. This temptation is still around us very much today. Satan readily tells us that we can and should be at peace with the world. And in a way, he's right. We are to strive for peace, for unity with one another. But the devil's condition is this, that we need to surrender our faithfulness to God and his word. His lie to us today is, well, you know, we know that not everyone agrees with the Bible 100%. So what? What's the big deal? As long as we agree on the really important things, then the rest, well, are really minor in the grand scheme of things, aren't they? So what if there are some minor discrepancies with the Bible? The important thing is that we, we all just get along, right? Well, then let me ask you this. Do you want to be the one who determines what is minor in God's Word? I know I sure don't. It's a lot easier for me to be the pastor knowing that I have God's sure and certain word to stand upon, to preach and to teach. That from cover to cover, it is the truth of God's word. Because if we don't believe it's God's word from cover to cover, we stand on not a sure foundation, but on shifting sand. Shouldn't we strive to understand God's word as he has given it? Or are we too lazy to tackle it? Poor knowledge of the Bible and what it says leaves you in the wilderness of the devil. The wilderness of culture and emotions which blow every which way like the wind blowing the snowflakes around this morning. Some churches, some pastors today seem to believe that God's commandments, well, they're optional. You choose the ones that you think are good for you. And so there's a degrading of God's word. We see this in all sorts of ways where God's commandments regarding sexual purity are sometimes seen as, well, they're minor. Some seem to think that murdering infants before they are born is a minor thing. And we have to ask, where does, it, where does it end? At what point do we decide that the entire Bible is, well, minor and not worth studying or following? When we take it upon ourselves to determine that something in the Bible is minor and not worth striving for, we commit the most hideous kind of idolatry. We are breaking the first commandment in a most grievous way. When we trivialize a part of God's word, we are daring to make ourselves equal with God. That was the devil's problem. As a holy angel, he fell from God's grace because he strove to be God's equal and not God's servant. In fact, when we try to place ourselves above God by arrogantly judging his word, we Again, commit to that sin of idolatry. We've fallen into Satan's trap. Satan would have us place peace and unity with the children of the world above our peace and unity with God. That empowers us then to go out with words of truth and love and kindness and strive for that unity to share with one another. A unity with God through Christ Jesus our Lord. When we make God's word minor, we disarm ourselves in the presence of the enemy. St. Paul once told the Ephesians to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. The word of God is our weapon against the evil one. Notice how Jesus used the word of God 
in our reading today. All those responses to the devil, even though Jesus is the word made flesh, even though he speaks with all the power and authority of God, he says that power still resides in what has already been spoken and what has already been written and given to God's people. And so Jesus uses words from the Old Testament in response to the temptations. The first one, Jesus says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. To the second temptation, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. And to the third temptation where the devil picks up on this play and says, okay, well, if you're going to use that word against me, I'll see if I can use it against you. And the devil says to Jesus, throw yourself down, for it is written that God will send his angels concerning you so that you won't strike your foot against the stone. Paraphrasing all of that together. And so Jesus responds again with the word of God. It is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. God's word is that weapon that Jesus used to recognize temptation to stop him dead in his tracks. It's the same weapon that God equips us with. So how dare we disregard it as minor? How dare we throw it in a corner and let it get dusty and rusty? God's word is the means that the Holy Spirit uses to produce and sustain faith in us. As St. Paul once told the church in Rome, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. The gospel being the word of God. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. When we make God's word minor and choose to live by our own interpretation, by our own means, we're committing slow spiritual suicide. We have to admit that we often fall into Satan's temptations. But our text before us today can give us thanks and praise to God because Jesus never did. Jesus withstood Satan's wilderness of temptation on our behalf. He is our champion. Jesus never compromised with Satan. Instead, Jesus stayed on that hard and narrow road that takes him to the cross. Eventually, the world would be his again, but not through compromise, but through promises that God had made and that Jesus fulfilled. Jesus stood against Satan himself in the wilderness of hunger. He stood against Satan's minions during his ministry. He endured temptation even to and even on the cross. Yet Jesus never wavered. In the end, Jesus has defeated sin, death, and the power of the devil. How do we know this? Because he has risen from the dead. He bought us back with his holy, precious blood and his innocent suffering and death so that we might be his own, his own servants in his kingdom, his eternal kingdom, full of righteousness and innocence and blessedness. <clears throat> with his victory on the cross, Jesus earns our salvation. He earns forgiveness for us. And now the Holy Spirit brings that forgiveness to us as he works faith in us through word and sacrament to deliver into our mouths, into our ears, into our hearts, the saving grace of God. So that we can, as the epistle lesson from Romans 10 today says, so that we can believe in our hearts that God raised Jesus from the dead and with our mouth confess that truth and show the world that we are saved. Praise God that Jesus went into the wilderness to fight the good fight that we can't win. And now Jesus anoints you with the Holy Spirit through the power and working of his word, through those means of grace, baptism, and the supper, to help you in the struggle against Satan's temptations, which are still strong and fierce in this world, including the temptation to compromise God's word. And if you have fallen into that temptation, if you have given in to the ways of the world, know that your Lord speaks to you today to tell you that you are forgiven. Thanks be to God.